Oh, we're on. We're recording, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, great. Here, here's part two. So, oh God, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. Like the footprint, like the the teeth. Are you looking from the dentist looking at your teeth? Or are you looking at the person's teeth? What's your perspective? Like stage right or audience right? Stage. What are we looking at? Your face is all I see. Well, let's say. What is he looking at? I said before on one of these other weeks that it's like if he says he's looking right here, then we can stand over here and bark at him. That we want his attention or we can go stand where he's looking. What's he looking at? He's looking at one who regards his Shem. Malachi 3.16 talks about that. He looks at one who will look at his word, the word of John 1.1. 1, 1. He looks at one who regards his voice, Deuteronomy 4.12. He looks at one who will walk humbly in his ways, which would be his chok, Micah 6.8. He looks at one who will regard his Mashiach. Uh, how do we know that? Because the word Mashiach literally means communication and conversation. So Shin Yod Het is the communication. And then as we talked before, it, the words that mean word, Debar, Nam, Amer, Hebet, Tet, Habet, and Malal are all words that have to do with speech. His complaint against Israel is you won't listen to my voice. Well, all those words, the word Kol, Kufav Lamed, his voice, by looking at his words, we're listening to his voice if we're taking it to heart. He has prepared something. He has gotten something ready. What is it? The word to prepare or make ready can be Zion Memnun. To be invited to what's been prepared could be Kufresh Aleph, which is also learn how to read. And to prepare to make something ready, to order it, like arrange a table, get something all set up, and then invite people to it is also Ayan Resh Kof. It's also Moed, Memvav Ayan Dalit, the appointed time that you're called to because it's been prepared and made ready, like making ready the Passover meal, which according to this calendar that we're regarding is tonight. It was also a couple of weeks ago when I was down in California and some people are doing it, I believe on April 8th. My point is, he's already told us what he's looking at or what he's looking for in a people. But instead of looking at what he's looking at and regarding those things, we all want to look at the sun, moon, and stars and say, that's where the real testimony is. Well, well no, it's not. And then I've heard people say, just plead the blood, plead the blood. Plead the blood. He told Israel, paint blood on your doorposts on the evening on the night of the 14th day of the first month which starts in the aviv the springtime you kill a lamb and put blood on your doorpost and then i will regard that household no we're not going to do that well some of us do that but he says no we say no we're not going to do that we're going to plead the blood of jesus and what does that mean that means please forgive me for not caring please forgive me for being a jerk and assuming that i'm right Please forgive me for disliking all of your stuff. Please forgive me for imagining my own God is more beautiful than who you have told us you are when you were talking to your own people. Please forgive me for everything that's not you, though I think that I'm worshiping you when I say your face is beautiful, but it's the face of my own imagination. And if I plead the blood, that that makes it all good. Really, does it? Well, it does in my own imagination. Okay, so in your imagination, plead the blood of Jesus so that it absolves you of doing anything he cares about. And in your imagination, your God will find you right because you believe in your own imagination of your God rather than listening to anything Yahweh said. And that's what it means to plead the blood. Why should the Holy Spirit that's been around for 2,000 years encourage, lead, facilitate with signs following and prophetic utterances the church's 
aggrandizing Sunday, Christmas, and Easter rather than what Yahweh simply said with his own voice, keep the Moed of Pesach throughout all your generations forever. Make the Sabbath day. Make the Shabbat. Seventh day, not first. It's an eternal covenant. It's the sign that I'm your Elohim and you're my people. So to change it on purpose because the Holy Spirit inspired you, then the Holy Spirit is a liar, which means it's a demonic Holy Spirit, not the real Ruach HaKodesh. According to Jeremiah 31, the real Ruach HaKodesh ought to lead us into being Am Israel, people of Israel. And if the Holy Spirit we believe in, who we sing to and about being filled with song of beautiful worship, if he's leading us to prefer Christmas and Easter, Ishtar, the Canaanite fertility goddess that Yahweh said that he hates, if that Holy Spirit is leading us to do that rather than regard the Shabbat and the Moedim of Leviticus 23, then it's a demonic fake deception. It's a lie. It's of the devil. So why should the church be of the devil? Because Yahweh said he's going to send a great delusion? Let's jump back to what we were talking about. Picture in your mind's eye the father sitting on his throne. Only he's invisible and he doesn't sit in a chair. He's some sort of spirit which fills the expanse and if the universe, the, the infinite universe can be seen as in a container, the real Ab, the real Elohim, fills everything way beyond and within the expanse of the infinite universe. He's, but for the sake of discussion, picture the father sitting on a throne. Nothing else exists yet. There's no universe, there's no heaven and earth, there's just the Father sitting on his throne. There's no time or space. And he, he decides to sit there and invent a word. And invent a word. Nothing else exists. There's no sun, S-O-N or S-U-N. There's no angels, there's no demons, there's no devils. There's just, he's just sitting there all by himself for hundreds of years, millions of years, and all of a sudden, one moment, he goes, I'm going to invent a word. I'm going to invent a word. Can you picture that? <laughs> what, what word is that? That's the word of John 1.1. 1, 1. We could call it an English word. In Greek, it's the word logos. In Hebrew, it would be the word dabar. And then, in his imagination, he invents this thing called this word, and then this word is going to become Adam, a, a human being, who then goes to this place that he's going to invent called the earth, and it's going to walk around on the earth as a consciousness called Adam, who is the incorporation of that word. Just if you could picture that. But what's the basis of this word? How big is this word? Well, to cut to the chase, let's say this word is 22 letters long. Elephant, Gimel, Dala, Havav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yod, Kachlam, Mem, Nun, Saifan, Pei, Zadi, Kuf, Reshim, Tav. There's the 22 letters. Well, why those 22 letters? So he has to design, he has to, before he establishes this thing called this word, he has to, he has to build why. What is the structure of this word? So he builds this middle, middle thing called the Mishkan pattern. Letters het through zadi. And he keys them to the Moedim. So he then gives his people the Moedim, which is the basis of the Mishkan pattern, which is then the narrative story, the gospel narrative that Yeshua is going to come and embody and run through the 22 letters, which is why, hey, isn't there some other way to do this now that I'm a human being? And now that I'm sitting here, please, please, is there something? No, you got it. Oh, gee. okay, not my will, but yours. So we 
went ahead, he went through the crucifixion so he could resurrect and come out the other side and coof up and come back coof in order to play out the, the word. But if he had to determine this structure of the word according to this pattern, and then he correlated the pattern to the Moedim, then we should be able to analyze the Moedim and say, what, what's going on there? Because that's him. That's what his face is looking at. That's his heart. That's his mind. That's his manifest. That's his son. That's his Aleph pointing to the Tav, and somehow it's held in the Moedim. So again, for the church to say, we have nothing to do with that crap, that Jewish nonsense, the, the detestable practices of the Jews, they alienate themselves from the true identity of Elohim, who goes by the name of Yahuwah Zavot, with every word out of their mouth of, of detesting his stuff. And the more that Jesus represents the church being his bride, the more alien be he comes farther away from this, these Moedim. So for us to regard the Moedim, Leviticus 23, starting with Shabbat, looking at Pesach, which is upon us right now. Joe Dumon kept it a month ago, keeping it today, other people a couple of weeks from now. But I'm just saying, this is it. This is the season right now. So the essence of Pesach he says, I'm going to make a distinction between your, see the word Egypt, it was Mitzrayim, Mem, Zadi, Resh, Yod, Mem. Yod, Mem is plural, Mem prefix means the place of or the tool, and Zadi, Resh, Zar. Zar is the word for rock. It's also where we get the word Caesar, Kaiser, like the Zar, like of Russia, or T-S-A-R, Zar, meaning this Overlord, who can crush and pound. It's like being between a rock and a hard place. That's the word mitzarim, mitzarim. So in the strait, S-T-R-A-I-T, straits of oppression, a narrow pressing of, that's the word mitzarim. And he says, I, in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5, where he, where he takes us out of that, he says, I, Israel, am your Elohim and you're my people. I just pulled you out. I rescued you. You are mine. I'm calling you my own. So that concept of the relationship is what he had in mind when he is sitting there on his throne, pondering, hmm, twiddling his thumb there. Well, I got to think of this word. And this word has to be, I'm going to make this universe. And then I'm going to make a bunch of Adam people, but I'm going to call out a specific group, a specific nation, a specific family. I'm, he had to think of all this before he made the word, before he made the world, before the son in the bosom of the father, metaphorically speaking, is that word, is this thing blossoming within him that he wants this type of relationship? That's Pesach. And for us to do Pesach, whether you kill a lamb and paint his blood on your doorpost is up to you what he said, but what do you have to do? What do you have to do? That's up to you. The point is, he said that we are his people and we are to observe this remembrance, this Zakar, Zion Kof Resh, this commemorative memorial throughout all our generations forever. Jesus is our Passover. Really, what does that mean? Well, you can make it mean whatever you want, but does that mean you don't do what he said because Jesus did do what he said? Is that if that's what your church is teaching you, do whatever you think is right. But my point is, Yahuwah said to Israel, each man in his own house, you close the doors, you don't go out until the next morning. Well, that's what they did back in Egypt. Does that mean you have to do that today? You could do whatever you want, but I'm just telling you what the concepts are. He basically says, I am your Elohim and you are my people. And I'm going to make a distinction between you and every other people group on the face of the earth, especially the overlords of oppression that he allowed to be our oppressors. Okay, we can find ourselves today in the same boat. The people that are running the, the jails, the doctor's offices, the prisons, I mean, the education prison, the justice prison, the science prison, the history prison, all the oppressions of falseness. And he's the truth. 
were his people. That Pesach is Ani Lodi Vidodi Li. I'm yours and you are mine. Matzot, Zadivav, means command, but an matzah means mem zadi alif means to find out how to do something. How to do what? If it lines up with the barbecue grill, it lines up with the choose life, that's Pesach. He, I, we want to be his people. Then the Torah right in front of us, find out what he commanded and how to do it. That's the meaning of the word matzah. Get rid of the leaven in your house, eat unleavened bread for a week. That's what he said. Right now, the Orthodox people are, uh, Greek Orthodox people are keeping Lent, 40 days of doing some kind of a fast. Where in the scripture did he say to do that? I know the church councils have declared that the people that of the church should do that. I don't remember reading anywhere in scripture that Yahweh told his people to fast for 40 days of Lent. I know that back in the corrupt days of Israel, the Jews were weeping for Tammuz, who was a fake Messiah, son of God, son of uh, Nimrod and Semiramis, but that was corruption. That wasn't sacred. Find out how to do what he commanded. He said, don't eat leavened bread for a week, for seven days. How hard is that? Get the leaven out of your house and eat unleavened. Make your own or buy it at matzah at the store. The point is that's why did he say that? So he's sitting there thinking of this word. He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna establish this thing, this, this. Why am I making the universe? Why am I making the planet Earth? Why am I making Adam? Why am I making a bunch of atoms and then choosing a small little group of Adam and say, I'm yours, you're mine. Don't eat leavened bread for a week. That was a really big deal to him. It's bunk to us, but it's a really big deal to him. And then he says, count seven sevens. That means you have to count seven. And if seven means perfect or fulfilled or filled to the full or complete your vow or get cursed if you don't complete the vow. Oh, so you're cursed. Blessing and cursing what? Well, suddenly, to make a vow or to keep your vow is a really big deal. So he invented the concept of a vow and he invented the concept of a blessing or a cursing. And right out of the gate, that's like, I'm yours and you're mine. Find out how to do what I said. Now you better make a vow and keep it. That's the most important thing in his heart, in his, what's his face looking at? It's looking at that. Oh God, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. And I see that your face wants me to make a vow and keep it and not eat leavened bread for a week. Okay. Is that the face that the guy was singing about? I don't think so. And then he has this parable that Yahushua talks about, about the sower throwing out the seed. And he says, the word of Elohim is the seed. And you're supposed to take the seed in like you are the open earth that oh, becomes impregnated by his word. And then you're supposed to nurture this seed, and let it sprout to life within you. And then how there's this picture that you are that life, that you are that nooning seed sprouting unto eternity. Another part of the pattern. Okay, those are the spring Moedim. And then he pictures six months later, uh, balancing on the other side of the year cycle, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Yatzeret. So you got Yom Teruah, shout. And whether you shout because you're in distress or you shout because of triumph and victory. And we think of two stories where that where there was shouting, it, it had to do with war. Jericho, Yerech is the word moon, like a full moon. And it, and they walked around the city, and it says that the, it's translated king, but the word is melacha with a hay, which means it was a queen. So there was like, a, it's like a beehive. There was a queen bee in Jericho, and they walked around the city, and they seven shofars, not a bunch of them. On the seventh day, they blew the seven shofars, and all the walls fell down, except where Rahab was, the innkeeper, the perhaps a harlot. But the point is, put the red cord out the window, and that part didn't fall down, because it's like... There's there's more to these stories. I'm just bringing it to people's attention who don't know the stories. But the uh, the idea that those shofars were a shout and the enemy was undone. And then Gideon, remember, 
300 guys, I think they had, and they broke the clay pots and the, the, a torch was in it and blew the shofars and the whole enemy camp went nuts and killed each other. The shout of triumph, our Elohim wins. Yom Teruah, there, there, it, when it talks about blowing the shofar in the Torah, it says when you're de, when you do what he said, like on the day of Shabbat, blow the shofar. When you keep one of the modim, blow the shofar. It becomes a voice of remembrance for you. And then there's another verse that says when you're in distress, you're surrounded by your enemies, blow the shofar. And you go, I oh, you know that voice, and shoom, he'll come to your rescue. It's an interesting correlation. You don't really hear people talk about that, but blow the shofar. And even if all you can do is roll up a or it's a, does it have to be, oh, give me a shofar from the land of Israel? It doesn't have to be that. It's shout, make a noise. It's do what he said. And some reason he got this thing in his head while he's sitting there before there was a world. And he says, I'm going to tell him to shout on a certain day, one day of the year, the first day of the seventh month, I'm going to tell him to shout, make a bunch of noise. And when they shout and make a bunch of noise, oh no, they're listening to me. So then I'll come and help them. Help who? My people. I'll help my people who are listening to my voice and do what I say. And I'm going to make a distinction between those who are not my people and those who are my people. So when you say God listens to everybody's prayers, well, he maybe he maybe could hear everybody's prayers, but he doesn't attend to everybody's prayers. We'll get to that in a minute in um, talking about... Uh, Book of Proverbs. Yom Kippur, the word atonement, kaf pei resh, means covering, wash clean. It's kind of like balanced scales of justice paid in full. But why is that after the day of shouting? Something about, you know, I was told as a Christian that it says in the New Testament that the, that the blood of sheep and goats and bulls can't wash anybody clean. And so Jesus had to come and die to really clean us. I'm sorry, but the word kapoor means washed clean, wiped away, absolved completely of sin. So the Christians had to make up that it wasn't enough. That's, but, but I'm saying something else happened. Something happened when Yahushua bled and died that wasn't covered by the day of Yom Kippur or the day of Pesach or Sukkot. But it wasn't what they're telling us. There was something else going on because the only way for them to tell us that Yom Kippur was replaced by the crucifixion is to say Yom Kippur didn't work. And Yahweh said it did work. He thought of it. So for us to be his people keeping Yom Kippur, what did he say? I and noon hey, reply, answer, humble yourself. Give this a regard of your attention this day. Does it mean don't eat and don't drink? No, that's Zadi Mem. That's, this is I and noon hey, answer, reply. Apply, sing, make it your business, your occupation. That's what you're supposed to do on Yom Kippur. Humble yourself, afflict yourself. Don't eat if you don't want to, but that's not what he said. Sukkot, fellowship, camouflage, refuge, chesed, rejoice for a week. The great party week. He wants us to have a big party week five days after a day of somber humbleness. He thought all this stuff up. Shemini Atzeret. Shemini is the word for oil. It also means to count. Atzer, Ayan Zadi Resh. Ayan Zadi is the word to, for wood or to take counsel. Ayan Zadi Hey, to take counsel. Have your eyes opened or have your eyes closed? Atzer also means to be arrested, restrained, ruled over, pressed and squeezed to stop, assemble, and celebrate, to say, hey, I can do whatever I want. No, Shatzeret means he's the boss. You do what he said. You're pushed, you're squeezed. It's a narrow gate. Wide is the gate, Babel, that leads to destruction and ruin. Narrow is the gate, Yahushua said, and few find it. The word Atzeret is this narrow gate that also means to stop and constrict. It's the word for constipation. It's like, don't work this day. Do not work the first day of unleavened bread. If if your Passover meal is is a, say a Tuesday night, 
don't work on Wednesday. If it's a Saturday night, don't work on that next Sunday. What The Passover meal is supposed to be the night of the 14th of the first month, depending on your calendar. And the 15th day is the first day of unleavened bread. He said, do not work. Well, and what are you supposed to do? Take a nap, watch TV, take a walk in the garden, do whatever you want. Talk on the phone with your friends. Don't work. Why? Because he said to stop. Atzeret. Shemini Atzeret also means my oil. So then when he has a parable of the five bridesmaids that didn't have oil, they didn't have Shemin. They didn't have Shemini. Zadi Resh, Straits of Affliction, Zadi Resh Resh also means to be tied up or show hostility told. So Ayan Zadi Resh, Atzer, take the counsel of Listen, you're either going to be under the hostility of Yahuwah telling you to stop, stop working on these days, or he's going to subject you to the mitz, memzadi ret, mitzraim, where you're going to have overlords with whips and cruelties. I mentioned before about the game of rocks. Zadi resh is rock. Salah is rock. Kifa is rock. Like Petros, Peter is rock. There's he, he plays off of these words. You look in the book of Revelation, and there's this lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. Why? It wasn't just a regular lamb. It was there's there's seven seals, there's seven trumpets, there's seven thunders. Why seven? Seven is the word for swear a vow. So way back in the very beginning, when he was thinking all this stuff up, sitting on his throne with nobody else around to bother him, he thought, fulfill a vow. Make a vow and fulfill it or get cursed for not. That'll be the number seven. There'll be seven vows. Seven eyes, seven horns. What's an eye? An ayin, literally, ayin, ayin yod nun means to weigh carefully, balance exactly, measure determine, scrutinize, and kufresh noon, the word for horn, power, prestige, privilege. Like if you have a great talent, you can do gymnastics, you can play music, you can, you have a great economy, your country has a powerful military, all those are kufresh noon, but kufresh aleph means learn how to read. Kufresh vav noon, I believe it is the keel of a ship, it's something which which causes you to be successful and stay on the straight way. So he built into the universe accommodations for Israel to maintain that trajectory. And then he put everything else around it to lead Israel astray and then says to Israel, Keep my Moedim, it'll keep you on the path. Wear blue in your Zitziot, and you'll look at it, and you'll remember to do what I said. Sit down on the Sabbath day, and it'll keep you like this keel of the ship. And I'm going to give you my words written in the Torah so that no matter how far astray everything goes, you learn to read, and will bring you back to this reckoning. Oh, God, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. What's the word face? Pay noon, pan, or pay noon yod mem, panim. But pan in the English word is where we get, you take a camera and you pan. It's panorama. It's the full spread. Pan, pay noon, literally in the dictionary, Hebrew means sort, type, kind, specimen, or variety. The spectrum of colors, the broad difference in notes of frequencies, light or sound, from low, big waves to high pitch or short waves, every possible permutation, every possible bit of variety is pan. So the pan of Yahuwah's face is the letters between Aleph and Tav. Is that the face you see when you're saying, oh, Lord, you're beautiful? Because if that's what he gave us, and according to John 1, 1, 
it is with him and it is him. And if that's what he invented to be his face, because see, pay is a mouth or that which opens. If you have something secret, nobody can see it and you open it up and disclose it. That And what jumps out, whether it's a picture, whether it's a concept, whether it's an understanding, whether it's life. That's noon. It noons because the meaning of the noon and the meaning of the pay. So the meaning of the word pay noon is that which opens up that's been hidden. Israel to be in Egypt, in Mitzrayim for 430 years since Abraham was given that prophecy. They weren't in Egypt the whole time, but Abraham was given the prophecy. And then when he released them on Pesach and Pharaoh said, get out of here. Bah, that's pay noon. It's also Zadi Aleph. To see his face in these letters is pay noon. It's in the letters. Pay noon yod mem, for some reason, the word face is typically in the plural, panim. In fact, the table of showbread is lachem, which is bread, panim, which is face. But it means to show. Showbread, it doesn't say showbread. It says lachem panim, the bread of faces. Well, what faces? Well, Israel had 12 tribes, 12 faces, as it were. The breastplate, the chosen of the high priest had 12 stones, 12 faces, 12 of the variety, as it were. So for 12 to be of the variety, to 22 to be of the variety, those are types of faces. If you look at um, Proverbs 28, 9, those who turn their ear from hearing the Torah, even so their prayer is an abomination. Mem, Samic, Yod, Resh is the word translated turn. Ear, Aleph, Zion, Nun, Vav, from hearing, Mem, Shin, Mem, Ayan, Shema, Torah, Tav, Vav, Resh, He, even so, back at you, Gimel Mem, prayer, Tefillah, Tav, Pei Lamed Tav, abomination, Tav, Vav, Ayin Bet, hey, let's look at that real quick. So, Samic Resh, this is Mem, Samic Yod Resh, it means the term, but Samic Resh means sullen, ill-humored. Samic Resh Resh is stubborn, rebellious. It's like, ah, come on, I don't want to do that. Yeah, that's that attitude. We don't have to. That's that attitude. The one who says, hey, that's not my God. That way I got nothing to do with it. I've got some different thing. I've got, I got Easter eggs. That's that attitude. Samic Yodresh, visit, tour, reconnoiter, a thorn, a hook, a boat, a small pot. It's where we get the word siren, which is like, remember, Odysseus, the Greek uh, story, the Odyssey, where the siren song, those the mermaids or the wind through the rocks would sing and the the ships would get closer and they'd get caught in the turbulence and smashed on the rocks. The, the word siren comes from that word Samic Yod Resh, which is the hook, the boat. See, it, it all goes back to this Hebrew. It's, it's like if the hook of, that grabs your boat, it doesn't float my boat, whatever hook grabs your boat and you, you pull away from that, that attitude. So the mem prefix can mean at or away from. Samic Yod Resh Tav, an elite military unit of special ops or a battle cruiser. And then if you put, see, sometimes a Tav can act like in between, kind of like a Yod or a Vav. Sometimes you can put Tavs in between. You'll, you'll see that. Sometimes you got haze at the beginning, but more of the structure. But if you, if you look at Sonic Tav Resh, it means pull down, destroy, refute, hide, conceal, hiding place. He hid himself carefully, kind of like Bet Gimel Dalit, Secret protection, Satar, Samic Tav Resh, Samic Tav Mem, hide the words and seal the book, Daniel, that, that hide the words, Samic Tav Mem. I'm, I'm just bringing certain things to uh, into your consciousness here. To hide the truth of the Torah, to pull your ear away, to say, I don't want to listen to that, it'll destroy me. That's what he's talking about. But if he, But you could also read Mem as the place of visiting, reconnoitering, the place of looking close, Aleph, Zion, Nun, Vav. Well, Nun, Vav can mean our, O-U-R, and Aleph, Zion can mean then at that time. But Aleph, Zion, Nun is ear. 
So whoever turns his ear away from hearing, mem in the which case meshema means away from hearing. But see, I can read this the opposite. Whoever turns to reconnoiter at that time, we do hear the Torah. Even so, Gimel Mem, which is back at you. See, it can be read both ways. Back at you, his prayer. Tafila, pay lamed. The root of the word paleo, wonderful, marvelous, that which is hidden. And then the last word then, tavav, ayin bet, hey. Well, ayin bet is the word for thick cloud or beam, like a big chunk of wood that you use for a building. Condensed. A thicket. His prayer, which is this ethereal thing, becomes solidified. Aleph becomes bet. The potential, remember we looked at uh, Genesis 2, verse 5, and it said there was no rain yet on the earth. Not yet is also the a derivative spelling of the word for rain, which has to do with tet, mem, and resh. But the idea that there was no man to work the soil, but obed adama. There's no man to worship similarly to what he said. We're going to sing in beautiful songs, but we're not going to keep Shabbat on his day or keep the Moedim like he said. So nothing will sprout. Once man does what he says, once Israel does what he says, like dormant seeds buried in the ground for centuries, like Saudi Arabia blossoming, turning into a, a garden because of the all of a sudden though the, the ecosystem is changing presently it's like israel the land of israel that's supposed to happen there well you know they walked around saudi arabia for 40 years it wasn't the sinai peninsula the the israelites walked around saudi arabia and he said wherever you place your foot it'll be yours saudi arabia which is turning green is supposed to be the land of israel just so you know The word tav, vav, ayin, bet means idolatry, vice, and abomination. But if you look at tav, vav as the prefix in ayin, bet, hey, meaning the manifestation, you could say the one who turns to regard the Torah, then at that time, it becomes a real manifest. But the one who turns his ear from hearing it, his prayers are considered an abomination of idolatry. Why? Because they've invented in their imagination a different God than Yahweh's vote, the Elohim of Israel. You can believe whatever you want, but if we choose to align with what Yahuwah said, the earth and the universe have to respond. Samik Vav Resh also, if this is Mem Samik Yod Resh, so you look at Samik Vav Resh, it means to heap up a pile of wood. The word gimel mem means to heap up a pile of wood. So here's part of what Jordan Peterson was talking about, about these connected words. If you look at what all these words mean, you'll, you'll realize that there's this poetic weaving back and forth that you can only see in the Hebrew. Psalmic vav mesh means to turn aside, depart, to put aside, remove, or take it away, to separate a degenerate branch like a Judaizer, it also means original character leaven and to come to an end or cease. So I could say, well, wait a minute. Whoever takes leaven, whoever listens and takes away the leavening. Well, that's like the festival of unleavened bread, which in my calendar that we're regarding here is going to be tomorrow. Whoever will take away the leavening like we were told, like we heard, Mashma Torah. Even so, then my prayers will become a real thing that he will acknowledge. Has anybody ever told you how to get your prayers heard or not heard? Don't eat on Yom Kippur. That way you get, that way you get your prayers heard. That's not what he said. What he said was, get the leaven out of your house for a week, and then he'll hear your prayer. Why doesn't the church tell us that? The other interesting thing about Mem Samik Yod Resh, Mem Samik Resh means to hand over a message, to deliver, to betray or denounce, kind of like betray, like that Bet Gimel Dalit, but God, to deceive, to betray, to inform against, but it also means to devote yourself to. It's also the word for saw, like a fret saw, like zigzag saw teeth. 
there's a really interesting movie called Turn. It was on Hulu or Netflix or something a few years ago. And man, people's, it was about the American uh, war against the British, what they call the Revolutionary War in 1770s. And uh, people's alliance were bouncing all over the place. They kept turning from, which side are you on? And it's like, well, which side are you on? It doesn't work that way because every new bit of information, you change the way you perceive. And the only, like I've heard it said, if you're not a liberal when you're young, you got no heart. And if you're not a conservative when you're, got, when you're old, you got no sense. If you're not a Christian, you're an idiot until you learn what Christianity is. And then if you stay one, you're an idiot. What? What's going on? It's all about the information you have and how you respond to the truth. The word masorat or masora means handed down commentary, explanations like Talmud. It's not a bad thing for smart people to sit around and talk about stuff and figure out what's going on. But the question is, how do we know that we've got the answer? How do we know whether we're on board with the truth? Okay, let's go to Revelation real quick. We're going to jump ahead of the uh, seven churches and go to the place in, in chapter five where John is sitting there. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, about the, about the seven seals. And uh, there's a guy sitting on the throne. Hey, is that the same as the father? Is that Jesus, the son? If he saw him, no one's seen God. Does that mean Jesus is sitting on the throne holding a scroll with seven seals? Just think about that. No, that's the father. Where's Jesus? Well, Jesus is the crucified lamb, right? The the no, that, that 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 that's not really the picture, but but picture something. There's somebody sitting on a throne in heaven holding a scroll with seven seals. And like I say, there's like a big Easter egg hunt. They're saying, hey, go find something that'll open these seals. And so all the angels go running around, running here. They're looking in the heavens and the earth and under the earth. And nobody can find what will open the seven seals. And it's like, just ask Jesus to open him. He's standing right there or he's sitting right there or just go find Jesus. He'll know how to open the seals. That wasn't part of the answer. You see, just setting up a little scenario. And so all of a sudden, John starts to cry like, oh, nobody can open the seals. And the angel says, don't oh, come on, John, don't cry. Look, there's there's one. Look at right there. There's a there's a lamb that was been sacrificed, killed by its own. What? And now I'm not supposed to cry because their sweet little lamb got killed by one of its own. How does that open the seven seals? Oh, it's worthy. Don't you know that's Jesus? No, that, that's not what they said. And to, furthermore, that lamb has seven eyes and seven horns. So what are you supposed to do with that? It's a secret code. It's a secret code. What's a lamb? Well, a you, a you lamb, a can be a kibosh. That also means to stop. Seven, there's one lamb that means to stop. That's kind of like atzeret, shemini atzeret. Sheen hay can also mean lamb. There's a few other words for lamb. One means to go out or that which walks out slowly, but you have to look at all those words. But seven eyes and seven horns, seven, seven is the word for vow. Something about swearing a vow, but eyes means Balance exactly, weigh carefully, determine precisely, measure it meticulously, pedantically, punctiliously, get in there with every little detail and know the vow. What vow? The vow of vows. If the word vow is seven, shava, then the great vow, kind of like the holy of holies, the kadosh kodashim, adonai adonim, melek, melakim. So in Hebrew where you say, this of that plural, it's the greatest. So the Shevaim, Shevaim, wouldn't it be maybe the great vow of the great vows? But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, that's translated 77s. So you hear people today talking about the eclipse and uh, Daniel chapter 9 and the, the, the tri tribulation and the beast and the devil. It's like 77s have been determined for your people. You could say, the incredible vow, the great vow, has been determined for your people. 
What great vow? Huh? There's a vow? Isn't it all about the vow? Isn't the vow the thing that Yahweh was sitting there thinking about when he was on the throne before he invented the earth, before he invented the word, before he invented the Moedim? He thought, I'm going to be their people. And they're going to be mine. I'm going to be their Elohim. And they're going to be my people. And I'm going to give them a command. And they're going to find out how to do it. And they're going to swear a vow. And if they keep the vow, they get blessed. If they don't keep the vow, they get cursed. What's the vow? What's the vow they're going to have to make? Well, it's going to be seven. Seven what? What's the vow? It'll be the great vow. What great vow? Well, then you look at Daniel 9, 24, and the very interesting thing, it says, Seventy sevens or Shavaim Shavaim have been determined, and it's going to accomplish seven things. Here's one of the places where the Mishkan pattern is found, just so you know. It says, to terminate transgression. Well, the word terminate is spelled Vav Lamed Chet Tav Mem. Chet Tav is the word to something like that's uh, under your feet. Ket tov is where you stand, What to come to an end. You could, it might even mean to terrify me. You have to look up ket tov. But lamed ket means moist, fresh, or new, like abib. What's transgression? It's patient iron, like somebody saying, ah, pesha. like, I don't care about that stupid stuff. That's the transgression. The transgression is to not sit down on Shabbat, but to keep working. The transgression is to not keep Passover in the Moedim, but to think that has nothing to do with you and that you could keep some other festive ceremonial days as great worship. That's the transgression. As far as he's concerned, the transgression is to rip off your neighbor and think you can claim the blood of Jesus and be forgiven and it doesn't matter. That's the transgression. And so if the if the big white fence of the kingdom of Yahweh is just stop transgressing his kuf, his law, his command. Seventy sevens are put in place in order to stop. No, in. To realize there's a vow. So just quit breaking the, his commands. Is that what it's saying? To end sin. What's sin? Breaking the Torah instructions. So if there's no Torah, there's no sin. Hebrews 6 talked about that. So that's how I know that uh, those, those chapters in the middle of Hebrews that we talked about a couple of weeks ago are actually a distortion. The translation is a distortion. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. It wasn't necessarily Paul. So that might be a corruption that's stuck into the Bible to get us to continue sinning and transgressing. But if we do the Torah, that isn't sin. To not do the Torah is sin by definition. Therefore, to end sin lining up with the Torah, the barbecue grill, the third one, to wipe away iniquity, sounds like Yom Kippur, but it's a picture in the serious place, or in this, uh, this third place of the laver. What do you do with a laver? It's a laver of water. Wipe away sin. Well, if that lines up with Shavuot, to wipe away iniquity, iniquity is ayin vav nun. Ayin nun hey is to humble yourself and to respond and answer to what did the Torah say? What does Yahweh want us to do? Bring in everlasting righteousness lines up with them. Yom Teruah lines up with the menorah and the Mishkan pattern, which is basically do what he said as a good servant. See, all these things build on each other of what does it mean to be his people? If you, if you apply the Mishkan pattern to the letters of the alphabet, to the Moedim, correlated to the seven days of creation and see the way all it all fits and how it fills out the alphabet. And you see that when Yeshua came and said the parables and did what he did and was thrown into the tomb and it all just, it all fits like this big puzzle. Then it says to confirm the visions. Well, the interesting, the word confirm is exactly the same word as to terminate, meaning terminate transgression. It's vav lamed chet tav mem. But the first time they translated it terminate, and the next time to confirm. Lamed Chet, with Tav Mem being the suffix. Lamed Het being vigorous, moist, fresh, new, like Aviv. In other words, be enthusiastic about the vision. What vision? The word vision there is Chet Zion Vav Nun. 
chazon. Well, chaz, chaz chet zayin vav nun is also a cantor, a visionary to make a contract or be a prophetic seer. Chet zayin hey is an aspect form pectoral a vestment like you wear a vest. You know how the Roman soldiers wore this metal breastplate that looked like muscles. Like that's a Chet Zion. Hey, Chet Zion Yod Vav Nun Yod, visionary, imaginary, ideal, revelation, play, drama, theater. So to get a vision of a of a play like a storyboard, well, that's the Aleph Bet. So you could either imagine your own God, you can imagine Jesus being born on Christmas and dying on Easter and resurrecting. It has nothing to do with Ishtar, the fertility goddess. Quit even using that word then. Okay, we'll call it resurrection day. Okay, fine, but what day was that? Wasn't it the day of waving the cut sheaf, wave sheaf? Start counting for 50, and then he's going to... Uh, have another non non work day 50 days later. Yeah, we're calling that Pentecost, the birthday of the church. Nothing to do with the church. It had to do with doing what Yahweh said for his people of Israel. What I'm saying is that to confirm what vision, his vision, his vision for the relationship between and his him and his people. But see, the vision has to do with I, whether it's your third eye or your two eyes. That's the letter I and lining up with. Yom Kippur and prophets. Prophet, that has to do with speaking, that has to do with mouth. So there's the ayin in the pay, and then anoint the Kadosh Kodashim. Well, that's the Ark of the Covenant. That's the letter Zadi. That's the resurrection. And the word to anoint is Mashiach, which has to do with manifesting a place of communication. The blossoming is like everything he said is right here. I know I'm mixing all this stuff up, but what I'm it's laid out pretty clearly. It's right here, actually. What I'm saying, though, is when he says, no one comprehend Shaquille and Dalit Ayan. Shakal is not just comprehend, it's sleuthing of wisdom with astute cleverness. We're, gosh, we're pushing two hours here already. Here's the question. I'm trying to blend all this together. So you have seven seals. Okay, if the first seal lines up with the white horse, we'll have to talk about this next week. The second seal with the red horse, the third seal with the black horse, the fourth seal with the pale horse, the fifth seal with the voices saying, how long do we have to wait? The sixth seal, the stars fall, the sun, the sun goes black, the moon turns red. Hey, kind of like on the eclipse. And then the seventh seal, there's seven trumpets. It's like, Okay, but the seven seals just open up the gateway, bet, bet, for the scroll. What's written on the scroll? Does he ever, in the book of Revelation, address what's written on the scroll? This is taking most of the chapter of the book of Revelation between five and, um, I think the seven seals take you all the way up to like chapter 18 just about then you got the seven bowls and the seven trumpets that he doesn't tell you what's there but if they're all isn't it all the same voice what's written on the scroll does he ever open up the scroll in the book of revelation what's written on the scroll wouldn't it be what's written in the alphabet now i'm just guessing i'm just playing around but we, we, we're, we're allowed to do that if the seven if the scroll has what's written on the in the aleph bet then the seven seals are things which keep the meaning of the Aleph Bet, his great word that Yeshua came down and had to run the gamut of. That's the story. That's the Haggadah. That's the great narrative, the legendary myth. What other story is there? Well, then if there's seven seals restraining or holding back this Sefer from being able to be rolled open and read, what are the seven seals? Well, there's just seven of them. The first one, boy, you open up that first one, and the white horse comes out, and he's got a crown and a bow. Yeah, but what's the first seal? Now, I'm just guessing. I'm just playing around. But I could say, doesn't his name have to do with something? I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. What's your name? I'm 
Ehiash, there's something about his name that's been kept from humanity for hundreds and thousands of years. The Jews won't mention it. The Christians lost it, didn't care, turned it into Greek, Latin, English, call him Lord God, Hashem, Adonai, anything but Yahuwah, anything but Ehiah. But there's something about his name that's not just how do you pronounce four letters, which of the four letters, but it has to do with Shem being his name, fame, renown, reputation, occupation of all his concerns that we're concerned with Ayin Nun Hay on the day of Yom Kippur to look at that Malachi 3.16 says, those who, those Adam, those men who talked amongst themselves about his Shem, write their names down in the book. Something about that name. And that name is built on what every one of these 22 letters is. The Moedim, the great vow. What vow? Everything Yahweh said, we will hear and we will do. That great vow. And Yahweh said, and when I hear you, and I see you, then I will know that you're my people, I'm your Elohim, and I'm going to keep my vow, which is to protect you, defend you, wipe out your enemies, and pour out the blessing upon you, just like I vowed that great vow. It's all about that. It's all about that. So for his name to be absconded, obliterated, twisted, lost, My whole life, I might have heard Yah once or twice. I might have heard something about Yahweh or Jehovah. But the regard of his name, even the four letters, was not until the early 2000s, really. Some people's, maybe a little bit before that. The JWs, certainly, but there was no J. It was, it's, it's been pretty recently, I, I believe, in my experience of comprehension that his name has become a matter. And as soon as you hear his name, you realize, boom, his day is right there. As a matter of fact, look at the Ten Commandments. I am Anoki Yahweh Oheka. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Bam! He, the first commandment is not don't have any other gods. It's, his, it's him identifying himself by name. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Anoki Yahweh Eloheka. I just took you out of Egypt. You're mine. He's talking to Israel, not the world. And then he says, don't have any other deities. Don't make any of their graven images. The Shabbat is my day. So his, the Shabbat is right there with his name saying, it's my identity. And you change the Shabbat, you've changed my identity. It's an Elohim Akrim, sorry. Lo yili, yo, lo yayi lecha, Elohim Akrim Apeni. Do not allow or cause there to be other gods, gods of others, other Sabbath days, other festival days commemorating my identity, yoked to, I and Lamed, my face. If, if I paint a picture of Caesar Borgia or anybody else, and say, that's the face of my God. I've just broken that command. He said, don't do it. So why are Christian churches full of pictures of Jesus's face? Heaven is real. And then you got Jesus's face that that little girl painted by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's profanity. It's idolatry. He said the Shabbat was the sign that we're his people. Not the fact that we have a picture of Jesus or Caesar Borgia hanging on the wall. What did he say? How does the, why is Shabbat important? Leviticus 23 tells you it's one of the moedi, my ornamentation, my test, the testifies that bears witness. If we keep the Moedim and Shabbat that testifies and bears witness. Anybody got a testimony? You want to give your testimony? You want to get up in front and tell us where you came from and what you're doing? No, you want to give your testimony? Keep Shabbat in the Moedim. That's the testimony that you're his people and he's your Elohim. Doesn't matter what you see. Doesn't matter what you feel. Doesn't matter whether you feel the Holy Spirit and you're thrown on the ground convulsing like with the Kundalini spirit. If you keep the Moedim and Shabbat, that's a sign you're his people. That's what he said. And then when the Moedim, you see it has the Mishkan pattern in there, you realize it's not just seven ceremonies, but there's something else going on. There's a truth wrapped up 
inside the ceremony, when it breaks open, what nooms out of that pay of the Moedim is his identity and his relationship with his people. There's something that's written on the scroll that's kept in the Moed. And then when Yeshua had to come down and run that gamut because he had to keep those 22 letters. So if I go back and say, well, what if this, what if what I'm looking at are the seven seals? I'm just playing around. What if, what if his name is the first seal that's the white horse running out with the crown to conquer the bow? What's the word bow? Kufshin Tov and Kufshin Tet. Kufshin Tet also means to correct, to restore the truth. The truth about his name going forth to conquer with a crown on white. And the word white is sheesh, which means rejoicing. What's the word red horse? Red means shana, is the word shana, which means different or variant and bringing a sword. And if it lines up with the Shabbat, then any other day but the Shabbat brings war and blood. Any other day that's different than the Shabbat, like the first day instead of the seventh day. And if the black horse has lines up within the Moedim, then the balancing of scales, which is Mishfat, which is him saying truth, and you're going to pay for where you have failed to live up to your vow. If you tried to rip off your neighbor, the other guy you're in contract with, you will pay to bring that scales up to balance. That's what Mishfat is. Like I said back in the very beginning, if you make a contract deal with a guy and you both are in agreement, then if you fail, that's where you have to come up to level it off. Or the other guy has some advantage not to get over you, but the advantage of bringing it back level. And any contract you sign where you didn't know the details, you didn't really because you were deceived, then it's a avoided contract. But Israel was told clearly, what are the terms of this contract? But the Christians were lied to about the terms of the contract. You don't have to keep anything. Damn dirty lie. There's a great vow, the Shavayim Shavayim, the vow of all vows. Everything Yahweh said, we will hear and what we will do, and we will be his people. He will be our Elohim, and he will provide for us and defend us, and we will obey, we will worship and serve him as he commanded. That's the vow. And if that's the black horse, and the Moedim, the keeping of the Moedim are about that. Then what's the pale horse? Ah, sin, death, and the grave. Death, hell, and the grave. What's the word pale green? Yod, resh, kuf. That's the word for green, green, yellow. It also, resh, kuf means nothing but. Resh, kuf, av, nun, emptied out. Reshkuf Mem, derivative embroidery variegation, the formation of an embryo in the egg formed to take shape. But Reshkuf is nothing but, nothing but what? If that lines up with this concept of the Mishkan pattern, which is the cipher of the code of the Moedim, which validates Shabbat, which is the essence of his name, and then nothing but this Mishkan pattern? Well, I found this Mishkan pattern in 2004. The fifth seal is the voice is how long? Daniel 12. Daniel's told to hide the words and seal the book until the time of Kufzadi. Until the time. That's how long. Until the time of what? Ayan Dalit Ayan Tav. Until, until the time that you realize Yeshua is described being Mashiach by the 22 letters of the alphabet because of the Mishkan pattern, and that the meaning of the 22 letters are not ox, house, camel, door. Yeah, they're kept in that. They're retained in that like a suitcase carrying the essence, like something in your fist that opens up and the life comes out, pay noon. But what the letters really are is describing Yahusha being Mashiach. It's a catch-22. And if that's how long, if that's the fifth seal, then the sixth seal lines up with Knowing the alphabet letters, OT, Aleph, Av, Tav, Yod, Jeremiah 31, they will all know me from the least of these to the greatest, Aleph, Av, Tav, they will all know my letters of the alphabet. And that lines up with the sixth seal. And what happened at the sixth seal? Go back and look. The stars fell from the sky, the sun turned black, and the moon goes red. Kind of like the, the eclipse of April 8th. 
And what's the seventh seal? That's where the seven trumpets start to blow. And what happened after all this? The vow. Ephraim returns. Ephraim returns to to Shuva, to the Brit Olam, realizing that he's gone rogue, rebel, stubborn, Samic Resh. Ezekiel 36 ma- made the reputation of Yahweh halal in the eyes of the nations wherever he went, thinking he was doing Jesus a big favor, promoting Christianity or Judaism or some other ism. And it's like, no, it's supposed to be the um, the Brit Olam of the 12 tribes. And then when the 12 tribes come back together correctly, keeping the vow of Yahweh's word, because we've learned to read his oath to his people, his Shabbat, his Moedim, his Mishkan pattern, Yeshusha being Mashiach, his Oti. Well, then he brings the two sticks back together and then blesses his people. And then that's where Ezekiel 38, the other nations go nuts. They go insane. And then they come to attack once he's brought us back into the land. And that's when he just wipes them out. And there's a thousand years. That's Revelation 19. But you see, I pe- I hear people talking about Reve- uh, Ezekiel 38 and the Gog and Magog war. And it's like, if, if they, don't they read the script? Do they not read What's supposed to happen? You can't have the Gog Magog War of Ezekiel 38 without Ezekiel 37, without Ezekiel 36, without Jeremiah 31 of Ephraim coming back. Can't have it. It's not time yet. So what's the Sefer about? What's the Sefer that's that's held by, let's say hypothetically, these seven seals? His name, his day, his Moedim, the Mishkan pattern, Yeshua being the Ayin Dalet, the Ayin Tav, the OT of, of the great sworn vow to bring his people back. (laughs) Isn't that kind of the story of what's written on the scroll? And yet, all the angels in heaven were looking for one who could open it up. They couldn't find it except this slain lamb. And why the slain lamb? Because the slain lamb is a fractal prototype of not only Yahusha, but also of Israel. So you go back to then Isaiah 53, and the Jews say, it's Israel. And the Christians say, no, it's, it's Jesus. And it's like, It's a fractal pattern of that lamb. And when you see that, the whole thing opens up and makes sense, which happens to be where we are right now. Imagine that. So is it, when you're looking at the story in Revelation, is it about the tragedy? Is it about the seven seals? Is it about the devil, the antichrist, the just get us out of here with the rapture and it's about the tribulation. No, it's all about Yahweh restoring his favor to his people. That's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. It's about the Sefer. We're uh, right at the edge here of the uh, end. Yahweh regaining his people ever since the Garden of Eden. Yahweh regaining his people ever since that he talked to Abraham about, that he pictured with Moshe, that he just, I got to kill them all. No, okay, well. Yahweh regaining his people that, thank you, Mr. Solomon, for bringing in all the Elohim, Achrim, and Yahweh had, there's there's this other verse that the word is um, shavar, shin bet resh, which means like shiver, shiver me timbers, you know, where your legs are shaking, the um it means to to rattle to crumble to turn into the grit to, it means to break down grain into crumbles that you might feed the chickens it means to break a dream to break a code to solve the mystery solution but to break a dream also means he's he's had his dreams wrecked and ruined he's had his dreams broken by us but yet for us to come back and, and see this, we can also make his dreams come true. By keeping Pesach, by not working on Shabbat, by learning how to read. By not listening to the authorities that tell us the translations have been distorted and twisted that, so that we don't know what the truth is. If we say, no, the truth is retained in every word of every letter. 
just learn to read. Yod Kuf Resh. Kuf Resh Nun is horn, privilege, distinction, power, ennoblement, shining, glory, splendor, talent, the keel of the ship. Yod Kuf Resh Ikur Yakra Vayikra, the first word of Leviticus. Called, summoned, invited to an appointment time when everything is made ready, like the bridal supper, the Moedim, learn how to read. Learn how to read about the vow so that we can keep the vow and it'll change the world. Everything that everything that is destined to sprout that hasn't sprouted because there was no Adam to obed. Adama. Well, that's us. That's as soon as we, as soon as we worship by serving Him as similar, similar Adama, Dalit Mem, according to the blood, similar. It's all play on words. Why is there a slain lamb with blood? Plead the blood. Do what the blood says. Similar to His command. Anyway, we're out of time. It's um. 15 minutes past. So, uh, Carl, you want to close us out and then um, we'll have the uh, after show, but I've got things to attend to here, so I can't stick around very long, just so you know. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Abba, we are here to praise thee. Thou art so amazing. Thou art beautiful, Father. Thou art romantic and thou art grandiose and thou art strong and gentle and tender. And oh, Abba Yahweh, Abba Ud, thou art unrelinquishing loving towards thy people we praise thee father and we thank thee so much for preparing every single moed every single time thou prepared that table and and thou waited for us to come and join thee and although we were on a time out because we rebelled our our fathers our ancestors turned from thee and and we forgot Abba we forgot thy word we forgot thy voice yet thou has never stopped seeking us thou has never stopped calling to us and only thou knows which few throughout all this time Abba sought thee anyways and thou received us Abba, that thou art the loving father who waits for us, the rebellious children, to come back home and say, forgive us, Abba. We have sinned. We have gone against thy word. And instead of reprimanding us and instead of pushing us to the side in anger, thou opens thine arms and receives us lovingly. We praise thee, Abba, for this opportunity, for coming out of the time out, for having us come and sit at thy feet, at thy lap, and, and be loved by thee once again, and to sit with thee at thy table and enjoy the fullness, Abba, that thou hast created for us. We praise thee, for thou art amazing, forgiving, long-suffering. We repent, Abba, for ourselves and for our fathers of old who, who forgot all this. There is no better covenant. There is no better there's there's no better um anything Abba thou has made it perfect perfect and as we look we can only see that we have nothing but but a benefit from everything that thou has put in place for us we praise thee for thou art showing us thou art teaching us to read thou art patiently sitting with us and giving us instruction on how to walk this walk, on how to listen to thy word. And we stumble, Father, and thou helps us get up and try it again. So for that, Abba, hallelujah, wah, hallelujah, wah, hallelujah, wah. By thy Shem, Abba, the name above all names, Yahweh, Sevaot, and thy salvation, Yeshua. Amen. A beautiful thing. Thank you.